Welcome to the 8th of September. Schools resumed yesterday. Universities have reopened with in-person classes. There's lots of pedestrian traffic and road traffic is once again a challenge with increased volumes and the ongoing summer construction projects that are yet to be finished. There is a feeling of how things used to be pre-pandemic here in the city. Next week will be a telling moment for us as we approach the 15th of September, the day in which major COVID-related restrictions could be lifted if indeed we meet the targets of 75% of the population being fully vaccinated. Until then, we continue with our 10 a.m. Sunday in-person Eucharist, services on Wednesday mornings at 7.30 a.m. and Friday noon here in the cathedral. Online, along with this weekly check-in, our offerings of morning prayer Monday through Friday can be found on Facebook and our YouTube channel. Throughout the month of September, you can also join us for a walk through a labyrinth on Sunday afternoons, weather permitting. The labyrinth will be set out in Victoria Park, just across from the cathedral, from noon until 2 p.m. Untangle your mind, find your center, refresh your soul. This is a great family activity as well, so feel free to bring children. The online meditation group Thursday evenings at 6.30 p.m. is on a bit of a break and will resume in the coming weeks, so stay tuned for updates on that and all our services and activities. Today in history, September the 8th, is the day when Michelangelo unveiled his statue of David to the public back in 1504. Carved from a single block of Italian marble, that apparently had been rejected by other artists who work with stone because they thought the stone to be flawed, Michelangelo felt the flaw added to the authenticity of the character. His depiction of the biblical figure David shows not a young, timid shepherd boy, but a tall, muscular figure with slingshot and stone in hand, standing 17 feet tall weighing in at approximately 12,000 pounds or six tons, and it took him nearly two years to carve. The statue was commissioned for the cathedral in Florence when Michelangelo was 26 years old. It is considered one of the finest examples of Renaissance art. Speaking of biblical connections, today, September the 8th, is also recognized in Christianity as the birthday of Mary, the mother of Jesus, officially the nativity of the Blessed Virgin Mary. While her birth is not part of the biblical narratives of any of the gospel writers, an apocryphal text from the late second century called the Proto-Evangelum of James does offer an account of her birth to Anne and Joachim, the writing describes Joachim as a wealthy man and a descendant of one of the historic 12 tribes of Israel. He and his wife Anne had been childless to this point. In Stephen Reynolds' book, For All the Saints, he cites the second century legend which reads, once upon a time there was a Jewish couple named Joachim and Anne. They were elderly and their neighbors reproached them for not having any children. But God heard Anne's lament and sent an angel to tell her, you shall conceive and bear and your offspring shall be spoken of all over the world. Anne responded, as the Lord my God lives, if I bear a child, whether male or female, I will bring it as a gift to the Lord my God and it will serve him all the days of its life. And so it came to pass, Anne conceived, and when the time was fulfilled, she gave birth to a daughter and named her Mary. Both parents vowed to dedicate their child to the service of God. And so when she was three years old, they presented her in the temple at Jerusalem. And again from Reynolds' book, quote, and the high priest placed Mary on the third step of the altar and the Lord put grace upon the child and she danced for joy with her feet and the whole house of Israel loved her." Unquote. Tradition holds the birthplace of the Virgin Mary as Sephoris, approximately six kilometers northwest of Nazareth. The earliest document commemorating this date as a feast day comes from a hymn written in the sixth century. 
The feast may have originated somewhere in Syria or Palestine in the beginning of the sixth century, when after the Council of Ephesus, the veneration of Mary, the mother of God, was greatly intensified. The first liturgical commemoration is connected with the sixth century dedication of a church of St. Anne in Jerusalem. Now, countless hymns have been written to the honor of Mary, and I'm sure you're familiar with the great hymn, Ave Maria, sung by the likes of Pavarotti, Andrea Bocelli, even Celine Dion, or Josh Groban. But I was surprised to learn that the song is actually adapted from a narrative poem by Sir Walter Scott, the great Scottish novelist, poet, playwright, and historian. His poem, The Lady of the Lake, published in 1810, tells the story of three men vying for the love of one Ellen Douglas, set in Walter Scott's native Scotland. Well, a German translation of Scott's poem was set to music in 1825 by the great Austrian composer, Franz Schubert. Consisting of three songs of Ellen, one of which begins with the opening words, Ave Maria, the music has become more famous in a later adaptation that replaced the text of Walter Scott's poem with the Latin text of the Hail Mary prayer, based on the words of greeting from the angel Gabriel in the Gospel of Luke, when he announces to Mary that she is to bear a child. Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. So certainly, Ave Maria could serve as our song for this commemoration. You can look up any number of stirring renditions available online based on Schubert's music. And the Magnificat, the song Mary herself sings in the story of her encounter with Gabriel, is one of the most ancient Christian hymns. And historian Marjorie Reeves states it is perhaps the earliest of all Christian hymns. But I'm going to suggest an interesting intersection of the sacred and secular and point you to a song written in 1970, which has as its opening lines, when I find myself in times of trouble, Mother Mary comes to me, speaking words of wisdom, let it be. And in my hour of darkness, she is standing right in front of me speaking words of wisdom, let it be. That song, Let It Be, was written by the Beatles band member Paul McCartney, released on May the 8th, 1970, on the album that bears its name. It was the 12th and final studio album produced by the Beatles before they broke up, and each went to follow their own personal careers. As Wikipedia notes, at the time, it had the highest debut on the Billboard Hot 100, beginning its chart run at number six and eventually reaching the top. It was the Beatles' final single before McCartney announced his departure from the band. McCartney said that he had the idea for Let It Be after a dream about his mother in 1968. Mary, Patricia McCartney, died of cancer in 1956 when Paul was 14. He recalls, I felt very blessed to have had that dream. And in it, his mother had told him it will be all right, just let it be. So that got him writing the lyric to the song. In a later interview, when asked if the phrase Mother Mary in the song referred to the mother of Jesus, McCartney replied that listeners can interpret the song however they like. Indeed, others have indeed interpreted the phrase biblically. In his review of the single, Derek Johnson of New Music Express admired Paul McCartney's performance and the lyrics noting, quote, this is a record to stop you dead in your tracks and compel you to listen attentively. John Gabriel of High Fidelity reviewed the song as possibly the best thing musically that McCartney has done. Rolling Stone ranked the track at 20 on its 500 greatest songs of all time. Now that's high praise for a band that is the best-selling musical act of all time, 
that produced 21 studio albums, composed over 200 original songs with sales over 600 million, praised by Rolling Stone as the greatest musical artists in all of history, and whom Time magazine named among the 20th century's 100 most important people. So for a slightly different take on celebrating Mary, the Beatles, let it be. And here is a poem that captures the tradition of the birth legend of Mary, written by the Austrian poet and novelist, Rainer Maria Rilke. Born December 4, 1875 in Prague, the capital of Bohemia, now part of the Czech Republic, Rilke is widely recognized as one of the most lyrically intense German language poets in their history. While mostly known for his contribution to German literature, over 400 of his poems, though, were originally written in French, inspired by places he visited in his extensive travels throughout Europe. In this particular poem, he ponders what the experience must have been like for those angels tasked with setting forth from heaven on their mission to proclaim to Joachim and Anne the impending birth of a daughter. So here is the poem, Birth of Mary, by Reina Maria Rilke. Oh, what must it have cost the angels not suddenly to burst into song as one bursts into tears, since indeed they knew on this night the mother is being born for the boy, the one who shall soon appear. Soaring, they held themselves silent and showed the direction where, alone, Joachim's farm lay. Ah, they felt in themselves and in space the pure precipitation, but none might go down to him. For the two were already quite beside themselves with a dew. A neighbor woman came and played wise and did not know how, and the old man carefully went and withheld the mooing of a dark cow, for so it had never yet been. Birth of Mary, Rina Maria Rilke. Let us pray. God of faithfulness and truth, who formed us in the image of your word, grant us so to bear your Son into the world that this earth may become the cradle where you nurture your new creation. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Keep in touch, stay safe, and keep the faith until we meet again.